All right, Married at First Sight, season 11, week four, let's go. The first two episodes are an introduction to three new couples. So basically all these couples get married. The first couple we are introduced to is Michael and Stephen. Now, Stephen was the groom that was run off on. He's now been presented with a new husband called Michael. Now, the only real road bump they've kind of run into is the fact that Michael doesn't feel like Stephen's first choice. I am struggling with you being matched prior to this and your intention for being here and if you wanted to, you know, get to know me and, and you were doing this to get to know me or if it was just anyone. His walls are up, guarded, thinking that he's coming in as a replacement, which is, I don't see it that way. You and that, baby. And I guess the thing is, Stephen didn't really choose anyone. The whole premise of the show is that you get paired with someone never having met them before. So he had no say in the matter. On top of that, he never actually met the previous husband. It's not like he met the previous husband, got dumped by the previous husband, and then ended up with Michael. They never actually even met. There's not too much to be retroactively jealous about on paper. However, what I think is going on is that Michael feels insecure about the fact that he wasn't the expert's first choice for Stephen. Learning that Michael had been previously matched in, in the this experiment instantly I, I felt sick I, I just felt like this is this is not a genuine match then if that's the case this is a really last minute slapdash you'll do so he must be taking the experts seriously and being like oh these experts opinions are gospel which which by the way if you're putting faith in the experts opinions you are playing this wrong and notorious at this point for just pairing genuinely awful couples every single season why would you put any stock in relationship experts that seriously think the photo ranking task is like a good constructive idea for couples uh next we have jade and ridge now all you need to know about jade and ridge is jade is a mum. she has a young child and ridge acts like a child ridge is like one of the boys uh he's like 27 He's a psychiatric nurse, by the way, which, yes, is a fine profession, but I can't believe he's a psychiatric nurse, given how he behaves. I don't want to tell me how good looking I am, because I know that, and I tell myself every day, I don't need two people to tell me that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he's got this cringe catchphrase that he always says, which is Dece with these boys. Basically, him and his trio of buddies are like 18-year-olds in the bodies of 27-year-olds. It's really perplexing to watch. Perfect match. But now, boys, give us a Dece. Jeez. However, weirdly enough, despite his cringe humor in front of the boys, seeing him one-on-one -on -one with Jade, he actually seems like quite a good partner. He seems like he has a sense of humor. He seems really committed. And when he was asked about whether he was comfortable with the fact that she has a baby, he actually really pushed himself to give like an emotional answer. I'm wondering honestly if he's just a bit of a dickhead around the boys. Next, we have Madeline and Ash. And honestly, this couple is like breaking my brain. Now, Married at First Sight so far this season has had a few moments that I actually said reminded me of The Curse, if you've ever seen that. But it's, it's it's had a few moments so far where it feels like it's deconstructing the show. Earlier we had Collins where they would show us these long unbroken takes of him just processing his thoughts and trying to think of a TV worthy answer. How are you feeling about Natalie? <laughs> Could you repeat that? Okay. Do you want to share um, bed with uh, your wife tonight? Look, we all get caught up in the moment. It's human beings. I just got married. What a day. What a day. We're Married at First Sight used to be a show that was dedicated to selling an illusion of reality. This season of Married at First Sight has had a few moments where it actually makes you sit in the discomfort of the reality they're trying to create. It's actually really fascinating. I can't tell if it's an intentional choice to try create cringe or what they're actually going for, but so far I've been really enjoying it. We also saw this with Ben and his intentions. He's been constantly prodded as to whether he's on the show for the wrong reasons, and he consistently can't give the camera a straight answer, almost adding to this idea that a lot of this show is either scripted or fake or intentionally designed just to create drama rather than actually pair successful couples together. The reason I bring all this up is because we are introduced to Madeline, an actual actress, like a professional actress. She was on Upper Middle Bogan. She was on Wentworth. She has pivoted careers apparently to a psychic medium. Now look, I'm not going to be a douche and come on here and be like, you know what? Uh, this is all heebie-jeebie bullshit. I don't understand it. That's not real. But what I am questioning is her intentions and also whether this is just a weird avant-garde acting performance. Now, and there's a few reasons I'm thinking of this. First off, when she walks down the aisle, she kind of directs the cameras. There's a shot where she literally looks into the camera and says, is this it? Is this the shot? Like, is this good? Are you good with this? It seems like she's almost directing her image. So beautiful. Oh my gorgeous. <laughs> 
And apparently in an interview with cast members of this season, they actually talked about the fact that it was way more overblown in real life. And she was apparently like directing the cast and crew to make this perfect wedding. Secondly, while I can buy the career transition from actor to psychic medium, the way she acts outside of all her psychic moments and her spiritual downloads is just weird and odd and feels very performative. For example, the cow situation. So basically long story short, on their first night of the honeymoon, they have a steak dinner. On the second night of their honeymoon, they go and visit cows and she genuinely starts having like a hysterically emotional reaction to these cows. She starts crying and she goes, humanity is so shit. I'm such a shit person. I can't believe I ate meat last night. Like I can't do this. She starts screaming into the clouds and saying she feels bad for animals and she feels like a shitty person and she's so weird. And it's all these weird outbursts that just feel so performative. Hey, at least we didn't eat these ones. Well then, they're still here. I'm gonna cry. Don't! Stop! Why am I so annoying? <laughs> So there are two things that are probably happening here. She's either an actress that's trying to boost her career and like do this weird practical joke on Australia and play the most unhinged weird character we've ever had on Merit at First Sight. Or she's just got like a really bizarre fake personality that just feels really disingenuous, similar to Collins, right? Like she's just constantly seen there trying to look like a good person for TV and it's just coming off really disingenuous. Oh, my issue with her isn't the fact that she's a psychic medium. It's everything around her psychic medium downloads and moments just feels fake, inconsistent and confusing. The only other real thing of note for these first two episodes is Cassandra and Tristan and I just need to vent. I am so disappointed with Tristan. What is he doing? Like, it's so unlikable. Basically, Cassandra this whole time has been like really supportive and really trying to help him with his self-esteem and his body issues and everything and just be like, hey, like you've got a good partner here. Like we can be a good couple. Now, yes, I understand self-esteem issues are hard, but at this point he is self-sabotaging. And not only is he self-sabotaging, he's taking out his self-hatred on Cassandra. She basically raises the fact that she's getting bored and they feel like friends and it feels really stale after weeks and weeks of patience and he just completely starts lashing out and spiraling and going and going and going about like I've done these dates and I've done this stuff and I've done this stuff and now you're saying you're bored and so clearly what is happening is he's deflecting he's trying to find something that he can grab onto so he can blame Cassandra instead of looking inward and realizing what he needs to work on it's so painful to watch what do you mean you're bored it's like how are you bored like seriously like I've planned every date now I'm trying so hard to make, like, to, to make you have fun. But what do you need me to do? No, that, that's why I don't know I, what I, I'm I, expecting. I, I'm just trying to figure out what you want. Like, and then I get I'm not sure if you're having a good time, and it just frustrates me. I need a break. Whatever, I'm obviously the dude, so I'm obviously the bad guy, so it's all my fault here again. On top of that, just the scenes we see where they're interacting in the apartment or the hotel room, he's so quick to assume everything is awful and that she hates him and like, you know, we may as well break up and we may as well have this argument and just like raise the stakes. It's genuinely getting really painful to watch. That scene where he goes, oh, well, you're pissed at me for sleeping in another bed. And she goes, I'm not pissed, I was just sad. And he like keeps elevating it. Did you sleep well? Yeah, I slept good. Yeah. Um, obviously slept on the couch last night. I just needed some space, but like, um, I'm definitely not gonna do that again because your reaction to that was not good. So, I can tell you're very angry and pissed off. I'm definitely not angry and pissed off. I'm not angry. I just want affection, touch closeness but to me what it feels like is he doesn't feel worthy of Cassandra and the love she's trying to give him he doesn't feel worthy of self-love so he's taking it out on her and he's trying to just like rush the end of this relationship so he can spare himself some pain but watching this unfold especially for poor Cassandra is just so painful to watch on top of that I have more to rant about Tristan I cannot stand the fact that he shows more interest in everyone else except Cassandra and opens up to everyone else except Cassandra it's driving me nuts yes I did say that the boys moment in last week was really sweet but that's because they came to him he has not been trying to be intimate or engage with Cassandra the most he could do was like a pat or a kiss on the head really strange but then the level of interest and excitement and engagement he shows to other couples like turning to Cassandra and being all like gossipy and like these people are going to do this these people are going to do this it's like why can't you be this interested in your wife's needs it's so frustrating to watch then even worse at the dinner party he starts opening up to Timothy and being like oh I got Timothy a bottle of wine I call him dad like we're best friends like I really look up to him and and like I want to show him a good time again that's like cute but water your garden at home what are you doing 
put this effort and engagement into Cassandra. And I think he can't do it because again, he's just so insecure and just can't get out of his head. But watching him put all this effort and communicate and be emotionally fun and sprite around everyone else except Cassandra genuinely feels like something toxic that she would need to navigate. Like it genuinely sucks for her. I feel bad for her and I haven't seen too many people talk about this. Thank Happy you. Father's Day. <laughs> <laughs> love your dad, love your dad, love your dad. You have kids. I vote Tristan as the nicest guy in the experiment with the biggest heart. It's something very, very sweet for me yesterday, very cool. You know, you got me a body you patron. Did you like the card? The card said, you, um, you might be grumpy, dad, but we still love you. <laughs> you are, you, you know, you're a freaking legend. Yeah, but it's your father's day. Hey, look, it's a joke, but he always, because I'm a bit older than Tristan, and he calls me dad. The innocent reading here is that he's not ready for a relationship with women and he prefers the company of guys and friends and lower stakes relationships and that's fine but in that case he probably shouldn't have gone and married at first sight and he definitely should not be trying to shift the blame onto Cassandra whenever he can. While we're here speaking of the dinner party this dinner party episode opens with a revelation. Jono gets home to Lauren and apparently has told Lauren hey there was an exchange I had with Jack at the gym where he basically said that oh like if we get to couple swap week I give you permission to fuck Tori because I don't want to fuck her because I'm not attracted to her. Stated he hopes there will be a couple swap in this year's experiment. So another husband can sleep with his wife so that he doesn't have to. This is a really bad thing to say. Even as a joke, there are too many like Freudian slips here that are uncomfortable. Now look, yes, you know, this wasn't a joke of like, oh my God, Tori is so incredible in bed. We have such good chemistry. Like, I wish you could experience that. No, this is a fucked up mean thing to say, basically saying like, I am so not attracted to my wife and I am so checked out. They're like, hey, like, you know, maybe you can give it a try. Even if it is a joke, which I don't think it was said as a joke, it's, it's based in truth and a really uncomfortable truth, which is that Jack and Tori haven't been sleeping together. She wants to sleep with him, he isn't sleeping with her. So why is he saying fucked up things like this to Jono? Jono gets home, tells Lauren, and Lauren basically says, yeah, I'm definitely gonna tell Tori, I'm definitely gonna bring this up. Now important to note, she tells Tori in private, which is the most respectful thing to do here. Tori then is visibly, visibly upset, and Jack starts to notice and starts going, what's wrong? Have I done something? Has someone said something? What's going on? What's going on? He does a little bit of detective work and goes, oh, the last person she spoke to is Lauren. It must have been Lauren. Lauren's fucking up my relationship. So Jack starts confronting Lauren and being like, what'd you say? What'd you say to my wife? What'd you say to my wife? Lauren kind of avoids getting into it for a bit. And then she starts going, well, apparently you said that you're not attracted to your wife. You want to trade her off so other husbands can sleep with her, blah, 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 blah. They have this huge, huge fight back and forth. Jack gets caught up on these stupid word games and semantics being like, oh yeah, well, um, I, I, I said, you know, I find her attractive, but I'm not attracted to her, blah, 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 blah. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Unacceptable behavior on a whole nother level. Tori just deserves better than that. I'm not talking to you, Lauren. Yeah, Shut your mouth. Him. Essentially, what this massive fight leads to is this like awful moment where Jack goes, I didn't say that. I don't know where you're hearing this. Jono, Jono, I didn't say that, did I? And Jono, instead of going, No, you did say that. I did tell my wife. I'm sorry it's been brought up here, goes, Um,. No, no, yeah, no, you, you say your wife's attractive. Yeah, no, you do say that, yeah. Your hands are f***ing tight. I'm going to give your brain to you when I'm f***ing tight, Get Lauren. Everything you've ever said to me, you've always said that you find her really attractive. Yes, yep. Thank you. Jack was just absolutely denying everything that Lauren said. You hung me out to dry. Now I just with the dickhead calling out my friend and her dude in front of everyone. But like, you told me you'd back me up. Lauren is crushed. She's just suffered complete verbal assaults from Jack for like 10, 15 minutes trying to do the right thing. And Jono didn't stand up for it at all. Really disappointing. Could Jono have a case when he gets home? Like, hey, if I tell you things in private, like I really don't want it aired out in that way again. I don't want to be involved in fights. Like, please just like think of me in this. I'm going to get in so much trouble for this. I was not meant to say anything. Sure, but he really Really need to have her back in that moment. Anything else, sort it out later. On top of that, Jack in the argument literally says at one point to Jono, muzzle your woman. All right, like she she's going off at him and he goes, oh Jono, can you muzzle your woman? Him, well, I'm, well, coming him. Have... I'm well, not I'm talking coming to you, him. Lauren. Yeah, Shut your mouth. Him. Can you muzzle Hi. your woman? Muzzle your woman. Muzzle your woman. 
The whole table's flawed. This has been a big talking point in like Australian media. Jono has a complete like puss burger response. I don't know what he was doing. He just kind of goes, don't, don't say that. It's like, dude, at that point, you do not need to defend Jack anymore. That's the big thing here. Even if Jono is impressed with Lauren's behavior or the fact that she brought it up, whatever, right? But at the moment that Jack says something like that to your wife, this isn't two people that you care about arguing and you're like torn and stuck between a rock and a hard place. He is the bad guy. He is the bad guy. It doesn't even matter if Lauren was wrong in the argument, which she wasn't by the way, but if she was, it doesn't matter because he's just said something fucking awful to your wife. And the thing is, I'm gonna give my breakdown as to what I think's going on. What I think is going on is that Jono doesn't like Lauren that much, so he doesn't think defending her and dying on the hill for her is even worth it because he wants to leave. I think he's staying with her out of pity and I don't think he likes her that much and that's why he didn't like have this knee jerk reaction to what was said about her. And the reason I say this is because previous weeks on the couch and previous weeks we've seen them together, basically the big issue has been Lauren has been really combative, picking fights with him, calling him boring and soft and too nice. And I think that's resulted in him being a partner that's completely emotionally checked out and disengaged. Engaged. I don't think he actually has the drive to defend her or put too much effort into this relationship. And I think the thing is, even with all that said, even if you're not into the relationship, just by the moral right thing to do, he should have had her back. He should have thought to himself, you know what, even if I'm not in this relationship forever, even if I don't like her as my wife, I actually need to stick up for her here and at least verify her truth. Like even if he doesn't fight Jack with her, he should have at least been like, no, you did say that. I did tell Lauren, sorry for sharing that information, but like, I'm not gonna sit here and let you gaslight her. On top of that, then in private, he actually says to Lauren, yeah, no, everything you were saying is true. That is what I told you. And it's like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? Like, why didn't you just say it? Lying, eh? so then why didn't you just say, yeah, well, that's what I told Lauren. She's not lying about it. She's not making I get it up. Because it looks like I'm just making it up now. To say, oh, I told Lauren those exact words. Who cares about being friends with Jack? Like Jack's gonna be friends with Jono anyway. Anyways, this is all revisited in the commitment ceremony. So we get to the commitment ceremony, a few things to note. First off, Tristan says leave to Cassandra. Dude, what are you doing? What are you doing, Tristan? He's being paired up with like a supermodel girlfriend. This is like the biggest example of self-sabotage I've ever seen. This is someone who wants to be there for him and care for him and actually really likes him. She says that multiple, multiple times. Like I see so much in him, I see so much potential and he's just blowing it up. And then he does the whole like, oh, I don't want to put you through any more pain or discomfort. You deserve someone so much better than me. It's like, dude, she wants it to work. Can you just step out? Personally, I think what's going on is due to the self-esteem and body issues he's outlined, I think he's not ready to sleep with Cassandra. He's not ready to take these next steps. He's scared of getting hurt. He's scared of getting emotionally attached. So he's just blowing it up, but just so painful to watch. I don't know what is going on with the men this season. Next, we have Ali and Ben. Ali writes leave because Ben is a fucking robot. I don't know what the deal with Ben is. I can't stand him. He says something later in this episode that I just could not believe, but we'll get to that. And by the way, rightfully so, good on Ali for writing leave. Then we get to Madeline and Ash. So, so far Ash has been dealing with Madeline having psychic download. Do you know what I mean? Everyone wants to talk to you and I want them to be able to communicate, but I don't too, because it's like scary. Can you just know you're so protected? I love you, you're so protected. That's what I'm saying, is that this is why I'm like a weirdo. You're a wood. No, I am, I'm a weirdo, no. And then basically shush him at the table and being like, they're trying to talk to you and all this like kooky stuff. Then on top of that, having the meltdown about the cows, not talking to him, getting moody, getting like weird. Um, He writes stay and after a week, she already writes leave quoting nothing of substance as to the actual reason. She doesn't say, I don't think we're compatible. She doesn't say, I don't think this will work. Nothing. She's just like, the universe is calling me and this is what I need to do. Strange, weird. I think she's full of shit. I don't really like her. What a disappointing character. But next we've got the big one, Lauren and Jonathan. Editing, sorry for the worst quality. I forgot to talk about Timothy and Lucinda. Oh my God, I am so sick of Timothy. Basically all that happens here is Lucinda and Timothy have had a pretty good three days as friends. Lucinda says this, she says, she says to the experts, yeah, we've had good times going out to the markets and stuff. It does still feel quite friendly and there's no intimacy. He then flips his lid and has a total hissy fit. And he's like, oh, we had a good three days. I feel like you throw me under the bus, blah, 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 blah. And I think she was raising a very, very valid concern. But he starts going off, completely throw me under the bus. And I thought we were having a good time, but clearly not. And then he has the goal to go, I regret writing stay. And then sit down, she goes, are you okay? And he goes, I don't want to talk right now. I don't want to talk to you. 
John, the expert, calls him out and goes, do not stonewall her, do not do this, or you will break the relationship. I am so not impressed with Timothy. On top of that, Timothy opened up to Tristan recently about something that happened with his dad, which was very heartbreaking, um, but he hasn't opened up to Lucinda about that. It just feels like this season, there's a bunch of men who refuse to open up to their wives and connect and do it to everyone else and then like blame the world for their problems. It's so painful to watch. Not happy with Timothy. Any kind of vibe? Yeah, I'm not convinced. Why are you throwing me under the bus? You're actually throwing me under the bus? Yeah, Tim, you've got to remember, bro, this is, at the end of the day, this is a marriage experiment, not a friendship experiment, man. Yeah, I get it, and I don't need advice from you. Comparing our, comparing our marriages, bro, you do. I, I actually I actually don't. I'm actually questioning why I wrote stay. So pissed off, I wrote stay. You okay? So. Lauren and Jonathan get on the couch and basically the moment they sit down, the experts are like, why did you not have Lauren's back? What are you doing? Bad husbanding. And he goes, yeah, um, I just want to apologize. And are you ready? He apologizes to Jack and Tori in this situation where he's already getting grilled for not having his wife's back. He goes, hey, Jack and Tori, I'm really sorry because I might have misconstrued and misrepresented what you said and set Lauren off on a warpath, which first off makes it look like, oh yeah, I've been a rational and emotionally volatile girlfriend and uh, I accidentally set her off on you. Sorry guys, sorry, sorry for my wife. She's fucking fuming at this point, like she's pissed. Now here's the thing, when this happened, there was a little part of me that was like, oh, maybe what happened, Jack told Jono something that wasn't as bad and then Jono in retelling it added a bit of flavor, added a bit of spice, not thinking Lauren would actually then quote it to them and now he feels bad because he misrepresented it. Maybe that actually happened. And But then I went, hang on, he literally said to Lauren, yeah, everything you said, everything I told you was true. So it's like, what the fuck are you doing? You have a chance to redeem yourself and instead you're doubling down and then apologizing to the person who said to you, muzzle your woman. Like, what are you doing? So then obviously Lauren's pissed. The experts are like, why on earth are you apologizing to Jack? It's weird, it's uncomfortable, I don't know what he's thinking. Anyways, he ends up writing stay, she ends up writing leave. Just so disappointed of Jono. Uh, I was so disappointed of Jono, I was really rooting for him and he's just totally, totally dropped the bat. Finally, we get to Jack and Tori. Jack is obviously just completely roasted for the muzzle your woman comment. He's roasted by all the women. John has a really good moment where he actually calls out all the men in the room and goes, what were you guys doing? Like, we're giving Jack a lot of shit, but like none of you stepped up and said anything. Really disappointed and they all sit there in silence. But yeah, Jack is just roasted and roasted and he keeps defending himself and he goes, yeah, it's an example of our dark humor. Like that's just a joke we sort of make. They keep pushing back and they get him. Like they get him. They basically every single point he tries to make is invalidated by the three experts. It's pretty great. They start grilling him about why he isn't sleeping with Tori. Awesome television. Also, I said I'd mention that cringe fucking Ben moment. When they go around the room and say, why didn't you say anything? Fucking Ben starts speaking up and goes, oh, well actually I only heard uh, some of the conversation. Uh, I didn't really hear the context, which Alessandra goes, um, what context do you need? Do you not realize that's a horrific thing to say? And he goes, I was just going off what I was hearing, you know, um, the, the decibels. It's like, what the fuck are you talking? What the fuck are you talking about, dude? He embarrassed himself in front of everyone. No one like defended him. No one was like, yeah, good job, Ben. It was just so awkward and clunky. I think he thought he was going to get himself out of a hole. Anyways, finally, the episode ends with another one of those moments I was talking about before where it kind of like breaks down the walls of Married at First Sight. And basically, Jack and Tori are left on the couch after everyone's packing up, everyone's leaving. And Jack starts doing this weird Machiavellian like, oh, you were a good girl tonight. Like, you really had my back. They were going to break you. You stood by me and like, I get to go home with you. And then she claps back and goes like, yeah, cause you have the key. Like I have no choice. Really, really interesting moment. I wanted to see if you'd turn a little bit on me, but you didn't. I'm still taking you home. Kind of have to. Hmm? I don't have a key. I like it. The thing with Tori is I love how loyal she is to Jack. Like if Jack was a good guy, if Jack was a good husband, Tori would be such like an unbelievable wife. But the issue is she's loyal to a fault to literally the worst person ever. But then when you watch this clip, you're like, oh, I see how it happens. Like he really tries to just drill into her. Like everything's okay. Everyone else is wrong, but not you and not me. It's everyone else. And I think she's starting to see like, hey, maybe this isn't the case. Like you really got roasted and she's starting to have second thoughts. Really interesting week of maths, really interesting conflict. The first two episodes were pretty tame, but the dinner party and the commitment ceremony more than made up for it. Thank you so much for watching. Tune in next week. Have a good one.